All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us here today. Uh, very excited um, to, to have Mary um, doing this here today as we kind of take a visual tour and have her sharing some stories of her time in Barbados. And she'll talk about, um, you know, a little bit of, of her background and share a little bit of her background, but it, it's really a pretty neat story and it's these pictures are, are pretty telling of, of her time there so we get a since we can't physically go there right now well I me mean, I guess we probably could but you know it's, it's a long ways away uh, a lot of time on an airplane yeah it's a lot of time on an airplane right now. so uh, but we're gonna take a trip visually um, so we will For a second there. All right. So, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna take a, a trip visually. So, um, put on your sandals, put on your beach hat. Let's go to Barbados. Go All right, Barbados. Mary Kramer, okay. go ahead and take it away. Thanks, everybody. I, it's so nice to see you all here today. Isn't it great? Just look out and see real people. Yeah. <laughs> and real faces. <coughs> so you can you can interrupt me at any time, um, and I we have questions at the end as well. But if something strikes you, just, you know, wave at me and, and we'll talk about it. Um, I, I didn't have a really good map. And you don't need to have, <laughs> you don't need to have a lot of reading of the words. So, but I'm just going to tell you about this, okay? So this island is 24 miles this way and 21 miles this way. It is a coral island. That is, as a result of volcanic activity under the ocean, it has been thrust up above the, the sea level so that you have uh, a, a just a beautiful, beautiful island. Don't ask me to explain much more about the geology than that, but because you know as much as I do now. But the other thing to know is that from the southern tip up to what they call North Point, it's uphill all the way. <laughs> and so this in here are really, really high hills, high hills. Uh, I'll show you a picture of uh, the residence, which is way above. It looks like it's right on the sea. But there's at least a half a mile from top down to the ocean from where we live. So it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, uh, Distance. The other thing you should know is that, uh, you know, like Iowa has counties, Barbados has parishes, and they're named after the cathedrals that are in that region. There's St. Lucy, St. Peter, St. James, St. Andrew, St. Joseph, etc. And there is a, an English, an Anglican cathedral in each of those parishes. Uh, I'll show you a picture of St. Lucy, which has celebrated its 375th oh anniversary in that building while I was there. It's really the architecture and the uh, stability is really quite amazing. And you can tell that Barbados has not had very many hurricanes. The only ones have tipped kind of this bottom right down here. And I would tell you that right down here is where my security people said, we would prefer you didn't hang out there much. <laughs> so uh, I would liken it a little bit like Court Avenue in Des Moines. Very young people, lots of rum, and music that I don't call music. So I said, you know, I don't think it'll be a hardship for us to miss that. Uh, and so I'll take you on a windshield tour. So. Uh, and then we'll come up to North Point, appropriately named, and then we'll go over here to Bathsheba, and then down around the um, East Coast, which is wildly rocky, and then to the lovely Gold Coast on the West, which is the beach that we dream about all the time. So it's... Uh, an interesting topography and an interesting geography, geology. 
but the people are wonderful. I will tell you that I now understand what it's like to be a part of a minority group because 3% of people on the island, other than tourists, are white. So there were not very many gray-haired white women running around. And so, <laughs> and so I was, what do we say, outstanding in my group. Okay, so let's start the trip. So here we are. It was January 4th. It was four below. The wind was blowing, and it was snow flurries that we left our house to go to the airport. What year? 2003. 2003. You have to have really good friends that come to your house at 5 o'clock in the morning on a four below day to pick you up and take you to the airport. When we arrive in Barbados, this is Peter, my driver and bodyguard. I used to say, don't touch Peter, you'll hurt yourself. He was uh, athletic and I still keep in, track with, in touch with Peter. We, it, it's great. And that's the armored car behind him with the American flag on one bumper and the State Department flag on the other. So I used to joke and say, well, if we are really at security risk, why don't we just put those flags on the front to be sure everybody knows who we are? <laughs> but nobody else found that amusing but me. So anyways, <laughs> now this is the front of the residence. Uh, there is no street numbers, uh, for that matter, street names in Barbados. It's only house names. So this house is named Las Cibeles meaning the sky is pretty much. And then there's the seal. Now, don't mistake, this is not the embassy. This is what you call the CMR, the Chief of Mission Residence. And I never referred to it as home. It was always the residence because I never felt like it was really our house, you know? I never got there, so. And it's well and gated. And just to the right of this picture is the security gatehouse. It's like having your parents there. If, I'm, if it's not Peter driving, if it's Kay driving, poor Kay, every time he drove out, they wanted to know where you're going, how long will you be gone, who will you be with? <laughs> and when he came back, he stopped. They ran the mirror under the car. So he said it's like, it's way worse than my mother, and I thought she was pretty bad. <laughs> um, and then we get to the front door, a beautiful thing. On either side of the front door are the flags of the seven nations that I represented there. When you walk in, you can see all the way through to the back, and this is the view out of the back of the house, the backyard. Now remember, I told you the Caribbean Sea looks like it's right beyond that hedge, but it's a long way, a long way. Okay, now we're on our windshield tour and we're going to North Point. You can see the difference between the lovely light blue Caribbean Sea and to the rocky shore of the Atlantic. And that's, that's a roar. That's a really big noise going all the time there from the water hitting the rocks. This is the whole town Methodist Church. All those parishes I told you about are are Anglican, Episcopal. But somehow the Methodists got in there, and actually the Catholics did too. So there is a Methodist church, one, and a Roman Catholic church, one, and uh, not too many others. Now you'll notice this church does not have any Sunday school rooms. So boys and girls, when they go to this church, they meet their teacher, there when they're dismissed from, you know, they have like the children's thing, and then they go out and meet their teacher, and they all walk to the beach, which is about a block, and then they have their Sunday school right there on the beach. That would be a different experience for children, to be sure. And it's, a, it's quite a unique place. It's not air conditioned. So one of the first things we learned is to look around if it's air conditioned, fine. If it isn't, find a spot by the window under a fan. 
that's very important information. So usually when we went, and we, we went here several times, we would sit by that back window, near the window, close as we could get, because there was a fan right there. And so the pews, the church pews, are so close together that they can't have room for the hymnals because you would just be bumping your knees on them all the time. And so the books are stacked across the room. And so the first time we went, we sat by that window under the fan, and in front of us was a lady who was a vision in yellow. She had a yellow dress, yellow shoes, yellow hat, and yellow gloves. She was glorious. It was just beautiful. So when we sat down, she turned around and said to Kay, the books are over yonder. And he said, thank you. But he didn't get up. So pretty soon she turned around and looked at him and said, the books are over yonder. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to go get books. OK. <coughs> so he got up to pick up the hymnals, and they were about this big because they had no notes. They only had words. And they were directly from the time of John Wesley. You know, John really liked to do hymns. <coughs> but this didn't have any music. Fortunately, the organist knew everything. The day we were there was his birthday. So we sang happy birthday to him, and somebody took flowers up there. The fan behind the preachers was broken. So we prayed for an electrician to donate his time to fix the fan. It was so personal. I just, um, it was a really lovely experience to go to that church. Uh, our next picture, remember I told you about St. Lucy? There's St. Lucy. And it is the same building for 375 years. Um, and it's been well cared for. It's perfectly beautiful on the inside. It's very much like um, Gilmore. That better, Biff? Okay. Um, it's very, it's, it's, I think, very close to Catholic because it's almost like mass. It's so uh, formal. It is so formal. And the uh, pastors or uh, priests swear, you can't believe this, but the, the head, the chief pastor of the Anglican Church wears a whole full leopard skin over top of everything. Now listen, this is, there's no air conditioning here. It's hotter than blazes, and he's wearing his. Good for him. OK, so next we're going to talk about forts. OK, so remember I told you it's quite hilly on the North Point, which is also the Atlantic side. And that's where all the scary stuff was coming from in the very early years. So this fort was built by the Dutch. And it had a great view of what was coming in in terms of ships. Well, the next ships that came in were the French. So they went up several <laughs> sides. Same hill, just higher up on the hill. And then came the British. OK, now we're serious. We've got cannons, and, uh, and we're at the very top of the hill. So that tells you really quickly the history of the island and who conquered at what time. So it's been Dutch, it's been French, and it's been British. Unlike some of the other islands, it was never French. Many of those were. For instance, the island of Martinique is still a prefecture of France. And so people speak French there and all the restaurants. And it's a lovely island. but. It's a part of France. Now, all of the islands that I represented were very recent democracies. What were the islands, Mary? The islands were Barbados. Well, I'm going to start from the north. Antigua, Dominica. Dominica is the island. They say Christopher Columbus will still recognize it because it just hasn't changed that much. <laughs> then the Saints, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, another thing. Thank it. And then Barbados and Grenada. Grenada is the closest to South America. Now, keep in mind, when you get to Miami, 
you still have a four-hour flight to Barbados. So it's, it's a ways down there. It's much closer to Venezuela than it is to Miami. Okay, so this is Bathsheba on the Atlantic side. And you see this again, this roaring sea, not conducive to the beach life, but very conducive to uh, surfboarding. As a matter of fact, it's the number one location to surfboard in the world. So you see guys coming into the airport with their surfboards, all wrapped up in some sort of case with zippers and everything. Who knew that those surfboards needed to be covered? But anyway, they unwrap them up there. But I think you have to have some sort of suicidal tendencies to try to surf up there. Because when you come in, it's rocks. So you've got to be able to turn yourself sideways to stop, or you and your border on the rocks. OK. Next, I'm going to show you the cave, because there's lots of caves. Remember I told you it's an up crust of, of volcanic activity, but it's all coral stone. So this is called Garrison Cave. And when Kay and I went down into it, it was just you walk along this very narrow path with a rope for a banister. And all the way down there, I'm thinking to myself, I have to go back up. Yikes. Since then, they put a little narrow gauge train that goes down in there as a, as a tourist attraction. But we, uh, we walked. OK, now this next one, Kay and I are having lunch at this place. And what I want you to know is that it's not a painting behind us. It is an open window. It's so, it's just so lovely. It's breathtaking. And those are the tops of some trees that are on the beach outside there. So it's really, it's a beautiful place. It was our, our we were on a windshield tour, it was one of our first times. And so the kitchen crew asked our waiter if we would come out and meet them. So of course. So um, we, they take us into the kitchen and here's all these people who say, are you the new ambassador? We said, yes, I am. And they said, Can you get us a visa? <laughs> and my answer is, uh, I've been told, no, that's part of the Consul General's job, and I, uh, I don't get involved in that, which was true. I learned never to do that. Okay, this is a road sign. Actually, if you want to go to Norway, you can find an arrow pointing in that direction, or to Russia, or to Denmark, or China. And I would tell you, there are no signs anywhere in Barbados, except there are signs for the bus stop. And the, those signs say, to the city or away from the city. Now the city is Bridgetown. But that's your best guess. Do the best you can. <laughs> uh, we got lost several times on the inside, in the interior of the island. If you're on the exterior, you can kind of tell whether it's the Atlantic or the Caribbean. But in the middle, in the, especially in the sugarcane fields, while they're high, they're very much like cornfields. Makes you feel at home in many ways. Because they're, uh, the, the plants just look a lot like uh, growing corn. It never gets as tall as corn, but it has, and has much larger leaves than corn. Hello. Okay, hello. This guy's a green monkey. And uh, he looks mad, doesn't he? But he was posing for us. I don't know if you can tell, but he has long fingers on his. And there were people at this national park having, having lunch or snacks, and they were in vans with the side door open. This guy went right over and snatched a banana out of the hand of a child, went back over, sat on that bench, and ate it. <laughs> like, you know, try to catch me. Yes. They're everywhere. <clears throat> and they're not really um, mean, except to each other. And this guy would be the chief of the tribe, without doubt, because most of them are a lot smaller than that. OK, now we're going to talk about national days. Remember I told you their independence 
was so fresh. Um, on every island, when they have elections, well over 80% of the people vote. Think about that. That's how valuable and how fresh the independence of those countries are. And it, they were all part of the Commonwealth until the British pretty much decided they couldn't afford a Commonwealth anymore. And so, to their credit, they spun each of these off as an independent democracy. Now, in many ways you say, well, that is really great. But in another way, you have to think, how many people does it really take, and what kind of an economy does it really take to have a, a true democracy? Uh, because it, it, it seems pretty simple, you know, you need to have elections, but you need to have a court system, you need to have fairly decent public health, you need to have some kind of a public education system. You certainly need to have law enforcement and courts. Now, all of those things require money and people. And so those prime ministers, as a rule, are traveling the world, getting money from other people. And they're kind of desperate in many cases. <clears throat> For instance, the, the island of Dominica prime minister and the island of St. Kitts prime minister um, were invited by the Japanese to be on the whaling commission at the United Nations. And in exchange for that, St. Kitts got the road paved from the airport to the capital, and Dominica got a fishing reservoir, uh, which was really nice for their fisher folks. Okay. But then they were expected to vote with the Japanese to resume the taking of whales. Now, the irony is, on both of those islands, at certain seasons of the year, whale watching was a part of their tourism. And yet, they didn't see the disconnect between voting the way they did and, and hoping that the whales did not become extinct. Okay, so now we're here on National Days, and any group that has a uniform is in the parade for National Days. Any. And the, and the parade goes slow march first, around the cricket field, and then quick march, quick step, second, and the band is playing. Now, one time this was going on, and the band was playing, Can't You Feel the Love Tonight? There's all these guys going by, the Prime Minister and the Governor General, demonstrating their big guns. <laughs> no one else seemed to see the irony of that. And it's an, another opportunity, really, because after they march around, they stand there through all the speeches. And uh, here we go. We have the governor general saluting the troops. Do you love his hat? <laughs> yeah, I think it's special. And the chief of police is, of course, standing right beside him, so nobody can get to him. And uh, here he's presenting an award to the oldest gentleman on Barbados, who at that time was 104. He got up out of his wheelchair and walked to where the governor general was to receive his award. It was very, very, it, to me it was very moving. But what is interesting is you can see all those people back there. Whoops, I went too far away. And um, it was a great opportunity for all the emergency medical people to demonstrate their skills. Because there they are out there in their uniforms and they just kept falling down. People kept <laughs> falling over. The EMT guys would go out there with a stretcher, load the person on and run off the field until somebody else fell down. And then the next thing, what happened? And the speeches <coughs> went on. And people just kept falling down and getting carried off the field. I mean, it was 100 degrees out there in the sun, and their uniforms were not conducive. OK. Now, we are at the 4th of July. I'm kind of trying to go through the year, all right? This is the 4th of July. And this is at our residence. This big pavilion is at our residence. And this is the Royal Barbados Police Force Band. And they really, really played. Well, well, I don't know if you knew, but my husband was a band director for many, many years, and he 
just fell in love with this group. And they invited him to play, which he, he played the trumpet and he said, I no longer have a lip to play with you guys. But one time when he was home, he bought arrangements, he ordered arrangements of music, band music by Carl King and, and music by Meredith Wilson, both really <laughs> famous Iowa composers. So the 4th of July after that, when the Barbados band was playing in our pavilion, they played 76 trombone. Isn't that Aww. great? I love that story. <laughs> so now we're in the 4th of July. Here's the crowd, 600 of our closest friends in our backyard. And that little square over there, that tent, is kind of where the podium and so forth is. And the Marines are presenting the colors. I have to tell you, it almost brings me to tears when they do that, because I have watched them on the lawn of the residence the day before in their cutoffs and their t-shirts and their bare feet, practicing until it's perfect. And then the day of the 4th of July, they come and use one of our, one of our bedrooms uh, where they change into their dress blues, and here they come. And it is perfect. And the young guy in the middle, I don't know if you can tell, but you can see the blue flag, which is the Barbados flag. They invite one of the people from the Barbados military force to present their flag as well, because their governor general is on the podium with me. And it's, it's just, it's so moving. And you see the gunny over just to the left of the other American flag saluting. And then the police band plays both the Barbados National Anthem and the Star Spangled Banner. Then I am decided that I'm going to learn to play the steel pan drum. <laughs> and I, play, <laughs> I, I learned to play their anthem and God Bless America because you cannot play the Star Spangled Banner on a steel pan. Just you know, not enough notes, it just doesn't work. So there I am playing, and Kay introduced me, and I tell you, I told people there that you, you have to have a real trust in your spouse to hand over the microphone just before you might make a perfect fool of yourself. <laughs> and you never know what he's going to say. Anyhow, uh, I played the Barbados National Anthem, and I don't know when I've been that nervous, because everybody there knew it. So if I made a mistake, no way to hide it. It's going to be right out there. So, here we go. Happy birthday, America. And that's the Governor General and his wife right behind me. His name was Clifford Husbands. And he was a charming guy. And his vehicle, his, his official vehicle was the 1936 Bentley. Mm -hmm. White. With the flags on the front, yes. Okay, now we're into August, and it's called crop over, because that's what it is. The crops are over. We got the sugar cane harvested. Now, it looks like corn, but it has really big, fat stalks, and that's, that's the meat of it. That's what they want. And so if the field is flat, they have little machines that will go in and cut it down. But if the field is hilly, then people still go in there with machetes and cut that stuff down. And they have a royalty for crop over, the king and the queen, and they're the people that harvested the most. And so there was no Miss America contest, let me tell you. These people are hard workers, hard workers. Okay, now they have bands in the parade. Am I not? Okay, everybody else is hearing me okay? I feel like I'm shouting at you. Okay, I'm one. Then anyway, if we're crop over, we have bands. And so we wondered how the heck are we going to have that many musicians on this island? Well, as it turns out, there's no, there's no music involved. It is the various businesses sponsor a band sponsor a band, you provide costumes. 
costumes. The costumes for women are very similar to uh, bikinis with a Las Vegas style headgear. And the costumes for men are very similar to Speedo swimsuits. <laughs> yeah. And they come in all sizes. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I mean, really, it's amazing. Uh, and they're all happy with each other. So, okay, so one band is the red one. Behind that is the green. Then there's the yellow. And then there's the blue. And it goes on and on. This parade lasts for at least four hours. If you, and it's hot, right? If you buy a uniform, it comes with a plastic mug with a handle and a whistle on a thing you wear around your neck. And so, if you run out of beer in your mug, you blow your whistle and someone comes out and fills it up for you. <laughs> now, oh, wait, I want to show you the, the stilt walker. These guys dance and oh shake hands with everybody and they're amazing. And I never saw one fall down. They just, they just have the best time. They're sort of like the clowns in between the bands, you know? So, okay, so now here's the music for part. And um, so you have a steel pan symphony, right? And it, it's on a truck and it just, you can see the speakers at the bottom of, hanging off there. They, and they play so beautifully, it's really delightful. And the, all the people in the bands are dancing along behind them. But when you drink all that beer, <laughs> <laughs> you have a float that is Kaibos. <laughs> and you see those two guys sitting there. I mean, they're, they're waiting for one to become available. And there is no, I mean, no big deal, right? And these appear periodically throughout the parade, these trucks, with the facilities on them. Oh, my goodness. So it's a, it's a unique experience. And you can see the Bob Marley guy down there with the white white face paint and the reggae yeah. um, dreadlocks cap, yeah. Okay, now, this is one of the interesting things about the island. You know, the palm trees are mostly coconut palms in the Caribbean. As a matter of fact, our gardener at the residence <laughs> could chinny up the coconut tree with a machete in his hand, barefoot. Yeah, try not to, I mean, a sort of a accident waiting to happen. But, so he would, they would just fall on the ground and then he would come down and all along the highway, all the time, our guys, you know how we get sweet corn out of pickup trucks? That's the coconuts are there. And they have these big knives and you go by and you buy your coconut and he holds the thing up like this and goes and hands it to you. And so knowledgeable people come with their own straw. But some people just, Drink it right up. And this was at the residence. And uh, that's a couple of friends who were visiting and our, our house manager in the middle. And she thought that actually some people there believed that you could replace, when you needed a blood transfusion, you could use coconut water instead of blood. Oh. Ugly. But I'm telling you, that's the truth. Okay. So now we're going to go to the farmer's market. Brighton Farmer's Market is in the community or the, the uh, region of Brighton and um, it's run by a, a Pyle family which is, he's the fourth or fifth generation on this and, and he took us over to show us his house which was 325 years old. And I mean it was, it was lovely, furnished with antiques from his from his ancestors, and he had two or three kids. They were building a swimming pool off to the side because the kids wanted a swimming pool. So the contrast is incredible. But it had on its porch, which was a completely wraparound porch, these things up on legs that were about the size of our coolers. You know the coolers we carry around sometimes. Only these were like, like kind of like early ice boxes. So the ice would come down in the spring from Canada, the shipload of it, 
and the people would <laughs> fill all of these things all the way around their house. And then pretty much they were so well insulated they would last until fall. Now there was a period of time when they didn't have ice so things weren't cold. But um, anyhow, that's the, the pile of plantation. And I put this in to show you that there is John Deere everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Only these John Deeres are built in Brazil and not in America. And that car next to it is Kay's car. He had a little Toyota station wagon. And it, he joked a lot about me in the huge Highlander SUV that was armored. And he's driving around in this <laughs> little plastic Toyota. That was his one. But I tell you, you only went to the airport. <laughs> he made a trip to the airport back and forth almost every week because that's how much company we had. All right, here we are. Now that tree above us is called the jacaranda tree. And it is, at certain times of the year, perfectly orange. It is simply gorgeous. Sadly, this picture wasn't there. But the piles at their farmer's market would have latte and cinnamon rolls. I mean, it was really a fun social morning. <clears throat> and people made jewelry there and painted paintings and besides the fruits and vegetables that they for sale. So, and they called themselves pile bucks. Think of Starbucks. Okay, so they had the green shirts and hats. They had the two white circles like Starbucks. But instead of the kind of mythological person in the middle, they had a little carrot pile of bucks. And, um, <laughs> and Starbucks tried to sue them. And Nick, I guess, said to them, take your best shot, just spell my name right. <laughs> and they never heard from him again. So he was able to maintain his pile bucks business. OK, now we're going to the Marine Ball. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Marine Ball, but uh, it's, it's a remarkable occasion. It's held annually on the Marine's birthday, which is the first uh, Thursday of November. And wherever there are Marines stationed, there is a Marine Ball, a Marine birthday party. And several things are required. One is they set a beautiful table with white linen, white linen napkins, beautiful china, beautiful crystal, and across the one plate, so service for one, is a single red rose. And this commemorates the fallen comrade. I still get kind of choked up talking about this, but I'll get on. And, and after we walk by there and, and kind of it's very quiet and solemn. And then there's the parade, and that's what I'm showing you there. And I, I'm escorted by the gunny, and I get to say a few words, and I try to keep that very few because I was still a little weepy about the table always. <laughs> and then there's a cake brought in that come around, it's flag cake. And the youngest Marine cuts the first piece and serves it to the oldest Marine, which is just another lovely thing. And then they cut it up and serve it to the rest of the people. Um, and then it's time for the ambassador to leave, because that's when the party starts. <laughs> and so these, these young Marines are looking like, is the ambassador gone yet? <laughs> I have, a, I have a great picture of myself with the Marines upstairs on the wall, and I just, I will, I got to promote some Marines. I actually got to, you know, Marines on embassy duty cannot be married. But one time we had somebody at the, he was leaving, he'd let, he was off duty, he was done, and he was ready to move on to his next thing, and his girlfriend came. And they got married on the beach. I had the power to officiate. Oh, oh my. So I married them. And I still hear from them. It's just such a sweet 
thing. I actually wrote a lot of college recommendations for my Marines. Are these all American Marines? Yes, U.S. Marines. I had nine, uh, um, battalion of nine, and their job is to protect the property and the confidential information. It's, we have the regional State Department people are supposed to protect the people. The Marines are for the property. And they serve in the box, which is the front door of the embassy, and you have to know who you're seeing, and they have to come out and get you. Otherwise, you do not <coughs> go in the embassy, except for the consulate, where you're going to apply it. Okay, lots of people love Barbados for vacation. In this picture, it is former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. Now, and the, the guy between me and Kay is the Prime Minister of Barbados, a guy named Owen Arthur. As you can see, he's got a sense of humor. Mm. <laughs> but Tony Blair ran around Barbados in his Land Rover, wearing shoes and no socks, and his Tommy Bahama shirt and khakis that most often looked like he just took them out of the laundry basket. <laughs> and he needed a haircut, and his wife was very disappointed in him that he didn't have a haircut. And without security, he just was having, he was totally around there. Now, the Serena Williams people often came to Barbados. The famous uh, singer Rihanna is from Barbados. Tiger Woods got married on Barbados. The people are so nice, they don't bother anybody. You know, the celebrities can come and go and enjoy themselves, and it's just fine. So I really enjoyed, this party was supposed to be at John Moore's rum shop, but it was raining, and the rum shop roof leaked so badly, they decided they had to move it to a hotel. Okay, we play polo in Barbados. And um, on this occasion, you're looking at the High Commissioner of Great Britain, that is what they call their ambassadors. And so they're playing a trip from, they're playing from a British team. And so they play both national anthems, and you're standing there with the horses behind you. <laughs> now when they play the United States, I was standing there with the horses behind me. I mean, and you, I'm, you know, you're close enough that if they decide they like you, they kind of put their nose right here. And it's hard to be properly reverent with the horse over your shoulder. Okay. So uh, I'm not showing you cricket, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I don't believe cricket will ever be a sport in the United States because they play it. Sometimes they play it for three days straight. Some days, one guy bats the whole day, and they could end in a tie. And I just don't think Americans could swallow that. So it's not quite uh, like that, but it is so civilized. You go at 10 in the morning, and you have tea and pastry. And then at 1, the team leaves the field, and you have lunch. And then at 4, the team leaves the field again, and you have tea. And then the, tea comes, the team comes back, and they play till dark. Repeat tomorrow. Repeat the next day. Uh, so uh, somebody gave me a book called Cricket for Dummies. I don't think I can ever master it. And I went with this guy to the cricket match. He thought it was his life's work to teach me how to properly enjoy cricket. So he was giving me all the insight, more, way more than I needed. So I don't have any pictures of cricket, sorry. Now, now we're at Old Year's Eve. We don't have New Year's Eve in Barbados. We have Old Year's Eve. And everyone, everyone goes out to dinner. So we are out to dinner. This is our hostess. She owns the place. She's Italian. And she loves, loves everyone. And so we're a group of, I don't know, eight or 10. And um, she is the most fun, the most fun. 
Next to us was a table full of people from Scotland, and the men were all wearing kilts, and um, they wanted to prove us to us what they did or did not wear under their kilts. <laughs> okay, so then you go out on the beach, and you leave your shoes by your table, so you can go back in and get them, because you're out on the sand, and most people are wearing high heels, and they don't, it doesn't lend itself to walking on the sand. Anyhow, while you're doing this, the, um, there's these teams of young men who are carrying these trunk loads of stuff out to boats. And then the boats leave and they head out to sea. Well, this then at midnight, the fireworks displays are to die for. They are amazing because all of those trunks they load in those boats are full of fireworks. So you're looking out there, and here, you know, this whole right down, up and down here, pretty much straight, every hotel had a huge, huge display of fireworks. So as far as you could see in either direction, it was fabulous. Okay, so now here we are at the new embassy. I almost got it built, but not quite. I, we actually went back the 4th of July after we came home because it was finished and dedicated. And it had been under construction for over 10 years. And I found that to be embarrassing. It was like, the Americans can't finish anything. Come on. So we finished it. But you see that plaque by my head. Um, it had a mistake. So they had to make a new one. And so, I brought that plaque home with me. If you want to see that plaque in person, it's on my porch upstairs. We will not be moving it anywhere because it weighs a ton, but that's where it is. And here we are on our way home, the front door of the residence. And that's it. So, what kind of questions would you like to ask me? How many years were you there? Four. Four years. Uh, I forgot to say, the temperature was pretty much 85 every day and 75 every night. And because we're so close to the equator, the sun came up at 6 and went down at 6 every day of the year. So you never had these lovely long, you know, as we start now looking forward to long evenings of daylight. We didn't have that. No daylight savings time? No, no, they didn't play that game. No daylight savings time. Brad, did you have a question for him? No, actually, it's not a question, Mary. I just wanted to tell everyone here that Mary uh, gave the library, uh, when she came here, several books on Barbados. Uh, if you'd like to look at them, we've got about five or six in our travel section in the library. Oh, thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you, friend. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Was the plaque that you got, okay, was the plaque that you got the square one or the big round one? Oh no, it wasn't the big round one. It was the square one okay. below. Thank you. And the mistake is, it had no date. They left the date on it, <laughs> and and it said, you know, and it says, "I Mary Kramer dedicated this building." Well, the building wasn't done, <laughs> and so the woman that replaced me, the one that's on there now, says this was dedicated by Mary Orsman. <laughs> but it's fine with me because I got to keep that. <laughs> it's very, it's very fun to have it up on my patio. So <laughs> great. Anybody else with a question? Oh, I have, I have one. Yes, please. Did you say? <coughs> I think it was the parade, the Independence Day. No, the parade was crop over. Okay, where they were scantily clad. Very. They did not play music. Yes. Usually, there were trucks with huge loudspeakers. So people were, you know, uh, dancing. But we also had that whole truck full of steel pens, which was what they call the Steel Pen Symphony. And it was playing, and was playing for a group as well. So yes, you had blaring music. But the bands didn't play. Oh, no, they didn't have any music. <laughs> okay, just... No, they were, they were there too. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't required to wear a bikini? <laughs> well, if you wanted to be in a band, you had to wear the uniform of the sponsor. <laughs> yeah. 
and everybody wanted to be in a band. Besides, if you were in a band, you got that mug, which was never empty. And a whistle. I like that idea. <laughs> it's giving me ideas, Mary. I'm There's all I, kinds I know. of incentives. <laughs> yeah. We could have a crop over celebration. Yeah, we should. We should have one. I, you know what? I, I was thinking of a, of a question. Um, you, so there's a prime minister and then a lieutenant governor. No, a governor general. Go, governor general. So, no, what? No, because each one has their own. You call them. Uh, so it's like the the state well, yeah. so, the governor general is more decorative okay. and is appointed by the queen. So there's a queen. Well, or the, queen. the queen of England. Oh, okay. Yes, Queen Elizabeth appoints the governor's general. But she only appoints people that are recommended by the prime minister. Now, the, the form of government on all these islands is like England. So it has, it's a, called the Westminster form. And that means the prime minister is elected and he gets to appoint the whole Senate. And then the House, and, yeah, the House of Commons is elected <coughs> by neighborhood, by region. Okay. Okay. Yes. And, uh, um, and, the, and the, the prime minister uh, and the foreign minister for my going away gift gave me a beautiful watercolor of their, of their government building, which is just a treasure for me. Uh, but it, and, they, uh, and I was in that building several times because they knew I had been in our Senate. And so they wanted me to see their building and their chambers. And, um, they have a raised platform at, on one end, which has a beautiful, big, upholstered red velvet chair with a carving all around. In case the queen comes to visit, we have the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question, Orville? What's the population? population. Yeah, what was the population? About 250,000 on that island, 21 by 24, and I swear every one of them had a car. <laughs> <laughs> and the roads pretend to be two lane, pretend to be two lane. And, and there's two highways, the upper road and the lower road. Hmm. <laughs> and, and the upper road goes to the airport. And there's two stoplights on the island and everything else is roundabouts. Now, my driver, my dear Peter, believes that stoplights are the work of the devil because if you're used to the flow of the roundabout, it just makes everything stop. And the flow, in his view, was much more conducive to smooth traffic than making people stop and then have it back up all the way and then they're rushing through. He just thinks that's all wrong. So. Did you have a follow up question, Orville? That reminds me of the roundabout up here. Yeah. I walk, you know, around there different times and things. There's so many people that come there and stop. They don't know what they're doing That's right. or where they're going. That's right, exactly. Now, keep in mind, Kay had a car and he drove. And not only do we use roundabouts, but the steering wheel's on the wrong side of the car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you drive on the wrong side of the road, besides. <laughs> so. But he, he mastered it. He got a lot of people back and forth to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and as we, we kind of uh, um, we finish this up, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, one of the, the major um, exports is rum. rum. So there is a, a island drink um, that rum punch, and can you tell them what the ingredients are for Yes, yes. Well, first I want to say one of the reasons the Barbados economy has stayed relatively strong and their sugarcane industry has stayed strong is not because of the sugarcane, it is the byproduct that is used to make rum. And, um, and they make really good rum, and I suppose there's like, I don't know, maybe eight distilleries in Barbados, so it uses a lot of product. And Mount Gay mm -hmm. is kind of the ultimate. There's another one called Coxburg, but they only make a little bit at a time, and they really supply the demand. They charge a lot. Okay. Now Mount Gay has a whole variety of times, and I told 
Justin, that Mount Gay Reserve is really excellent rum. So we're going to have a little rum punch <laughs> here. And here's, the, here's how it works. One of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, and four a week. All right, this means one of fruit, two of sugar, three strong of rum, four a week ice. I don't think you used maybe quite that proportion. No, I didn't. No, I made up my own proportion. But, but it is uh, the favored, favored drink. And when you go on the catamaran, they start with their own punch at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> and when you're coming in in the afternoon on the ship, you're back into the docks, and they do something called rock the dock, which means everybody's up on the front of the boat dancing. <laughs> and after you've had rum punch all day, it's not a problem to get out in the front boat and dance. Even my husband's sister, who is five years older than he is, was up rocking the dock, and her son was just done. I mean, he always had to sit down because he couldn't believe it. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's the catamarans. I didn't tell you about them, and they're fabulous too. To go scuba diving uh, with the big turtles. First time our six-year-old granddaughter went scuba diving, I was afraid she'd be afraid of those turtles because they were as big as she is. Mm -hmm. And so she got in with one in her little mask, and she's swimming around. And this one had a baby. So she's, she's fascinated by the little one, and she's swimming around. And I'm beside her thinking, what do these do if they get mad? I mean, I don't know what they do. But anyway, she swims up to me and lifts her mask up and says, Grandma, he likes me. <laughs> he's just all about being right with her. No, that it was a great treat. The kids came twice a year when school was out and at Christmas time. And then Krista, I forgot to tell you, you remember the picture of us celebrating New Year's Eve on the beach? That girl in the front was my daughter Krista. And she is the girl, I think some of you met her. She's uh, the girl that spent her life proving that blondes have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been very fun to be with her while she's doing that. So, yeah, it's all a good thing. So, thank you so much for your yeah, Thank you so much, Mary, so. for taking us on this trip. Thank you I so love much. You it. I love yes. it. It's like going back to myself. Yes, absolutely fantastic. And I, and I thank you. And again, um, I'll kind of pour up the, the rum uh, punch here a little bit. So, if you want to take one to go, yes. um, please do. And again, thank you all for coming and have a great rest of your afternoon. We'll see you all later.